I've visited lots of charges in my travels, and I've always wondered about all the boxes and cabinets and what they do at a charging installation. Well, now I know. Dave takes it on, looks at the structure of charging stations from 400,000 volts on the grid down to 350 kilowatts or less at the charger. What do you need? What do they do? And what is the future? This video looks at getting power from the grid to the site. A while back, I met the CEO of Westmoreland Limited, Nabil Sabu, on a filming visit to T-Bay Services on the M6. Westmoreland Limited runs not only T-Bay Services, but also Gloucester Services on the M5 and Kern Lodge Services on the A74 in Scotland. And they're now taking on another challenge in a brand new services to be built on the M56 in Cheshire. Well, I had an extensive discussion with Nabil and learned an awful lot about the problems of power supply that is hampering and delaying the projects at T-Bay Services. And other encounters I've had over the last few months have allowed me a much greater understanding of the grid, the DNO and charging locations. It seems there is something new almost every day. Well, this video gives a general overview of the first stage of the process of getting power from the grid into your battery. Much of it will be simplified to make it easier for non-technical people to follow along, where we're not all electrically trained, including me. And the national grid is not what people think it is. The national grid, as we call it, is simply the transmission of electricity. That is the power cables and pylons that you see everywhere you drive. And even that is but a tiny fraction of everything, as there are miles of underground cables that cannot be seen. But in general terms, the grid's job is to take electricity from wherever it is generated to wherever it needs to be used. So this now introduces the power generators. Well, a generator does what it says, it generates electricity. Although we immediately think of nuclear power plants, coal-fired and gas-fired power stations, the supply today is much more diverse. So the grid just gets the electricity from the generators to the users. Now one problem they face is transmission losses. Transmitting, ele transmitting electricity from, say, Dungeness in the southeast to the Midlands results in huge losses from inefficiency. So they choose very high voltage, around 400,000 volts. The higher the voltage, the lower, proportionately, are the losses. But switching up or down the voltage causes losses in itself, plus the power line themselves lose energy to heat. A staggering 25 terawatt hours of electricity a year is lost out of a total of 325 terawatt hours produced, or in English about 9%. Well, that is why the grid generally transmit the electricity long distances at either 275 or 400,000 volts. Now, in an ideal world, if we could start from scratch, we would have the generation right where we need to use it, and we would have no need at all for pylons and power lines. And believe it or not, that is where we're actually heading, very slowly. Besides the power stations, we now have, on a commercial scale, solar PV farms and offshore and onshore wind farms. And at a domestic scale, we have over one and a half million houses pumping their solar PV output into the local grid. Well, just think about it. If I have PV panels and they produce more than I need, the excess will go into the grid. So a neighbour is likely to use my electricity first rather than sending my electricity into the grid or having new electricity sent all the way from a distant power station. Well, this is called microgeneration or distributed networks where locally produced electricity can be used locally without the need to be fed into the national grid at all nor bumped up in voltage. Efficiency losses far less in future, this is likely to be a huge boom industry as it lowers the cost of electricity to the grid and cuts losses, thus requiring much less maintenance and repair. Again, we see in Scotland recently that many houses were cut off following the dreadful storm they had when power lines were destroyed or trees were uprooted and fell on the power lines. Now imagine, no power lines. The stability of the power supply is increased, maintenance and repairs are reduced. No blackouts. At the other end of the line, 
are the DNOs, or distribution network operators. Well, these take the immensely high voltage from the national grid and step it down in nice simple stages to lower voltages as it gets closer to where it is likely to be used. Brings it down from 135,000 volts for regional transmission, then down to progressively down to 33,000 volts and ultimately about 11,000 volts. So individual cities, towns and businesses take this 11,000 volt into substations scattered around and those substations reduce it to 415 volts for business and then finally to 230 volts that we use as individuals. Now you and I cannot normally buy electricity directly from these DNOs. Our contract is usually with a utility company. But again it gets com complicated because the national grid operates as its own DNO in some areas, and other DNOs also generate electricity in power stations and operate as a utility company, EDF for example. Now for simplicity I'm just going to keep them separate. So the site of an EV charging station typically gets its electricity at 11,000 volts into a substation nearby. And this substation is generally sized so that it can supply all that will be used locally, sometimes with very little left spare for expansion in the future. This is what T-Bay suffers from. At the services, the substation is pretty well at maximum capacity, and due to the rural location, it is many tens of miles to the next substation over prime farmland and national parks. Well, the long-term answer is just to get more power to T-Bay, but it's not like in a city where the next substation is just a mile or so away. Well, this substation at the grid installer, at the charger installation, will serve a number of businesses and ha this substation will serve a number of businesses and houses in the immediate area, and it is here that the biggest hold-up or blockage occurs. Put simply, grid is absolutely fine. Generation is perfect, got loads of capacity, but there is absolutely no incentive for a DNO to install more than the absolute minimum required today into each substation, and actually has a massive incentive to keep costs down by doing just that, the minimum. Well, think of it like the water companies. Simple answer to avoid droughts is to build more reservoirs, but that costs money and eats into profit, so they don't. They run just enough to get through a normal year with little to spare and just accept the droughts, they're not their fault. It's all down to climate change. Not our worry. Change for both will not come from the goodness of their hearts, but from the government action and legislation, which is totally lacking. Well, they struggle on. In many places, electricity demand is easily met. In others, it becomes an issue. It's a postcode lottery. When installing a new EV charging station, the installers will normally use any excess power available at the immediate substation, only looking further afield if that is totally insufficient. At Sandbatch Services, southbound, on the M6, where a grid serve installation is underway, the substation is actually on the ground, grounds of the southbound services in the car park, and it is easily sufficient to supply that and the northbound installation that is being installed in parallel. The substation is a mere few hundred yards from the northbound services, but unfortunately someone went and built a huge motorway between them, and that's a problem, but one that has a solution. Now it takes me back, 25 years ago I lived in a remote detached bungalow up a private lane and had the electricity supplied to my individual house from an overhead cable connected to a nearby telegraph pole, but no mains gas. The nearest mains gas supply was about 50 yards away across a field down on the nearby road. When I received a quotation for connecting my house to the gas main, I was astonished to get a quote for well less than a thousand pound. See, I envisage a team of workers digging up a trench over that 50 yards, several feet deep, under my six foot high garden wall, and then into the house. And as it turned out, that's not what they did. I was fascinated by the process. They dug a small hole, about two foot square, it's about 60 centimetres, I suppose, in metric, and as deep as the mains gas pipe. 
Then they dug another one at the corner of my house underneath where the gas meter would be located, also two foot square and to a similar depth. This took about 20 minutes. Then they stopped for a brew. Well, finally, they unloaded a compressor from the trailer and connected to a flexible hose, rather like a water hose, on a reel. To the end of the hose, they connected what they called the mole. One guy got in the hole and dragged the mole with him, with the pipe dangling behind it. Aiming very carefully right down the bottom of the hole, he pointed it at the corner of the house and pushed it gently into the soil. Then, with a flick of a switch, the compressor roared into life and began pulsing compressed air into the mole. And like magic, it just disappeared, dragging the hose behind it. Not fast, but steady. The gang then jumped in the van, headed off for lunch. Oh, or another job, I'm not sure which. Well, about an hour later, they returned. One guy got out a long rod and walked across my lawn between the gas main and the house, stopping to put the rod to his ear or press against his skull to listen to where the mole was softly banging away two feet underground. I got uneasy when they finally found it some ten feet off track. Well, they appeared totally undeterred and simply switched it off, pulled it all the way back again into the hole, pushed it into a fresh bit of soil pointing back at my house and set it off once again. This time they stayed and this time it ran true. About an hour later, it appeared in the bottom of the hole by the corner of my house. Well, he turned off the compressor, removed the mole, screwed on a connector, then attached a reel of bright yellow MDPE plastic piping and the guy at the mains end dragged it all the way back through. Gas connection made. Well, sandbag services, I'm told they used exactly the same principle, but very, very much more sophisticated and technological. Their mole was GPS guided. Not only could they track the mole every inch of the way, but they could also steer it. But a mass of paperwork and admin preceded that simple process. They needed to know that they would not hit any other cables, pipes or drains on the way. And more importantly, that they would not cause any subsidence of the motorway. Sensors were located everywhere, a bit like those used at fracking sites. And the process proceeded and went really smoothly. They dragged the cable through and saved tens of thousands of pounds and didn't have to shut the motorway. The two 11,000 volt cables ran from the substation on the southbound side to their own electricity control boxes mounted near each of the chargers. I realise this video is getting a bit long, so that's where I'm going to leave this one for the moment. We'll pick it up in the future and uh, explain and show how they get the voltage from the 11,000 going into the box down to produce 350 kilowatts at each of the chargers. Well, please subscribe so you don't miss future videos. I'm Dave.